All right. Well, good morning, everybody. And I'm hoping the screen will come up at some point. <laughs> there we go. Let's um, take our Bibles this morning and open them to the book of Genesis, chapter 32. And verse 22. The title of our message uh, this morning is Wrestling with God. God, of course, has been dealing with uh, this man, Jacob. Jacob, along with Isaac, his father, and Abraham, his grandfather is a very important character because through these men, God is bringing forth the nation of Israel. A nation that God has sovereignly determined to bless the world through. Jacob has spent 20 years in that circle up north in a place called uh, Haran. He fled there because of murderous threats and a rage from his brother Esau. He's sort of taken care of business there in Haran. He now and his growing family are returning from Haran to Canaan, the place of his birth. And it's there that he gets word that Esau is coming to meet him with 400 people. That would be kind of a scary thing, wouldn't it? Why do you need 400 people? So he doesn't really know what's going to happen. Is Esau holding a grudge from 20 years ago to kill Jacob? So Jacob has made um, appropriate decisions, sent some gifts ahead of time in a sort of an attempt to appease Esau. And as this whole situation is unfolding, we come to a place called uh, Peniel, a place that will be named Peniel because it's here that Jacob sees the face of God. It's here that Jacob actually gets involved in a wrestling match with God himself. <laughs> and so it becomes one of the most well-known stories in the whole Bible. But it's sort of sandwiched in between Jacob having dealt with Laban in Haran. And now he has to deal with Esau. He doesn't know how his relationship with Esau is going to turn out. And sandwiched in between here is this uh, wrestling match that takes place between Jacob and God. So here is kind of an outline that we can look at as we try to work our way through this passage. I don't think we'll get through all of it today, but maybe as the Lord gives us grace, we might get through some of it. Amen. The first thing that happens is he sends his family away. Remember, he's traveling from Haran back to Canaan, but he's not in the land of Canaan yet. And as he's sending his family away, you'll notice the timing of all of this, verse 22. It says, now he, that's Jacob, arose that same night, and he took his two wives and his two maids and his 11 children, and he crossed the ford of the Jabbok. One of the things that's very interesting about this is he is going to see the face of God. The area where this happens is going to be named after Jacob seeing the face of God. And the, the writer, Moses, who's accumulating all of this information, has already prepared us with the repetition of the word face over and over again in the prior material. Arnold Fruchtenbaum writes this, in the previous section in the Hebrew text, the word face appeared five times. 
as Jacob is figuring out how to interact with Esau, that I may cover his face to appease him. Gifts that go before my face. Gifts that perceive me when I see his face. When I face him, he will raise uh, my face. He will forgive me and the gifts went on ahead of his face, went ahead of him. And Fruchtenbaum writes, this sets the stage for the next division, which we're entering now, about Peniel and the face of God. It's sort of interesting how Bible writers writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit prepare us in advance for what's coming. And that's what has happened. So going back to verse 22, it says, now he arose that same night. Um, What particular night are we talking about? Well, you go back to verse 21 and it says, so the presence passed on before him when he himself spent the night in the camp. So he's just taking care of this uh, atoning work that he is going to send off to his brother Esau in an attempt to appease him. And this same night, as that whole section is closing off, this material here starts to take place. And it mentions there his family. It says, now he arose the same night and he took his two wives and his two maids and his 11 children. Uh, Three groups here. Two wives, group one. Two maids, group two. Eleven children, group three. Where did all these family members come from? Well, it had to do with Jacob's 20 years in Haran, where he accumulated two wives. And with each wife came a bridesmaid or a maid. So he's got two wives and two bridesmaids. From them came the various uh, sons of Jacob, and then thrown into the mix as a daughter, Dinah. Benjamin, the 12th son, hasn't been born. But this was the origin, when we talk through that, of the 12 tribes of Israel. And what we're going to get an explanation of here in our account of this wrestling match between God and and Jacob is how the name Israel came into existence. We haven't heard of the name Israel thus far, but you would expect in a book of beginnings telling you how everything started, specifically relative to the nation of Israel, that we would get some information on how the 12 tribes started. That's what we're seeing here. And we would get information on where in the world did this name Israel come from. You continue on into the last part of verse 22, and it says, he crossed the ford of the Jabbok. Here is a map showing you where the Jabbok River is. Um, Charles Ryrie says this of the Jabbok. He says, the Jabbok is a tributary, tributary of the Jordan flowing into it about 24 miles north of the Dead Sea. The name is related to the Hebrew word for wrestled. And so we're gonna see that connection a little bit later. But there is the Jabbok. It's a river there um, in the Transjordan, east of Canaan, that separates two areas. One of those areas is Gilead, up north, and then you'll see Ammon down south. The Jabbok separates those two in the east, and so we're no longer in Gilead, we're in Ammon. So it seems like Jacob is getting closer to returning to the land of his birth, the land of Canaan, but he's not quite there yet. And verse 23 is a description of a new camp that he sets up. It says, he took them, that's his family, and he sent them across the stream, and he sent across whatever he had. So everything that he had passed the the Jabbok, Uh, family, property. Um, He is, as I said before, no longer in Gilead, but he is in Ammon. He, of course, is closer to the promised land 
but he's not there yet. So all of this is sort of setting the table, setting the stage, if you will, setting the scenery in place for this wrestling match with a being that is called the angel of the Lord. And we start to see that story picking up in verse 24. First of all, notice Jacob's solitude. Verse 24, it says, then Jacob was alone and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. So the way I think it happened is he sent his family across the Jabbok into Ammon and then he came out of Ammon and he personally crossed the Jabbok again and he went into Gilead and so he's totally by himself. It's a time of solitude. He had crossed back to the north side, Gilead, and he was by himself. And when he is by himself, this is where this incident took place. And this is where the Lord appeared to Jacob for the third time. Um, Jacob has experienced direct communication from God twice already. And this is the setting for the third appearance. It's sort of interesting to me how biblical characters, in order to really receive something from God, frequently will separate themselves from the wear and tear of life, from the wear and tear of people. Jesus was probably the most loving man that ever lived. In fact, he probably wasn't the most loving man that ever lived. He is the most loving man that ever lived. There's no rival. And Jesus, because of who he was, was surrounded constantly by people. And yet there are times in Christ's life and ministry where he will deliberately separate himself from people to receive from God the Father. Luke chapter 5, verses 15 and 16, it says of Jesus, but the news about him was spreading even farther and large crowds were gathering to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus himself would often, that's an important word, slip away to the wilderness and pray. This is God in human flesh recognizing that he needed to, at times, separate himself from demands, separate himself from people, separate himself from ministry to be alone with God the Father. And if Jesus needed to do that, um, why wouldn't the world have we ever gotten the idea that we don't need to do it? There is a place and a time to be ministering to people. There's another place and time to be intimate with God the Father because you can't minister effectively unless you receive from the Lord. And so we need to start to develop in our daily walk, our daily lives, cultivate that habit of sort of practicing the presence of the Lord, having a a time that's devoted Between you and the Lord, maybe before the pressures of the workday, maybe at lunchtime, however it works out for you, just to be alone with the Lord, to to pray to God, to seek the face of God, to receive something from God, to communicate from God. And Jacob is going to be blessed here because of this solitude. Jesus was blessed in his ministry because of seasons of solitude. And I find that this is one of the greatest battles in my life to do this consistently because the pressures of life are so profound and the needs are so significant all around us that we, if we're not careful, can be very, very active. But our activity doesn't have the power that it could have because fruitful activity in God always follows intimacy with God. And that's what Jacob is doing here. He's alone. And God uses this time to reveal himself to Jacob for the third time. 
And what manifests is a wrestling match. <laughs> Verse 24, it says, Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. That's a long wrestling match. We know it's nighttime. Verse 22 has told us that. Verse 21 has told us that. And it doesn't give us a lot of details. It just indicates that a man appeared. And the two of them wrestled until daybreak. The word wrestling, I think, is very interesting because we wrestle with the devil, don't we, in spiritual warfare? That's what the Bible says. The King James Version, Ephesians 6, verse 12, says, For we wrestle, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. A wrestling match between the powers of darkness and God's people. But here it's not talking about some sort of demonic, satanic wrestling match. He's wrestling with God. Now, it's interesting here who initiated the wrestling. Jacob didn't. It says, a man wrestled with him until daybreak. I think Jacob had enough trouble. <laughs> he had just dealt with Laban. Now he's trying to deal with Esau. It's not like he wants another you know, combative situation. But it's God who initiates the wrestling match. Why is that? I think it's for the purpose of bringing Jacob to the end of himself. This is really the point in Jacob's life where his character that's been fundamentally changing and transforming is really brought to the point of breaking, where he reaches a point where because of obstacles that God threw in his path, he's got no one to trust in other than God. The current circumstance that he's in with Esau he understands he's not getting out of that unless God helps him. Just like dealing with Laban, I'm not getting out of that. I haven't gotten out of that unless God had helped me. And a lot of the problem with us is we, like Jacob, we don't really think we need help. I mean, we've sort of got things covered. It's kind of interesting that when you talk to a lifeguard, my wife was a lifeguard, um, when you go out to swim out as a lifeguard to rescue somebody, you kind of wait to the point where they're motionless. As long as they're panicking and, you know, uh, wailing away, um, arms and legs, you know, perhaps yelling and screaming, you know, terrified, you don't try to rescue the person when they're in that condition, because any lifeguard work worth their salt will tell you that in their panic, they will pull you down, the lifeguard, with them. You wait until they've sort of expended all their energy. You wait until they're sort of almost lifeless. Then you go in to rescue them. That, that's what's happening to Jacob here. God is putting him through a circumstance where he is expending all of his energy and he recognizes that through this he has no one to trust in other than the Lord. And once a person is in that position, they're ready to be rescued. They're ready to be used. And, and maybe some of you are in that condition today. Um, there's something that's happening in your life that's outside of your control. You're kind of flailing away. I would submit that God perhaps has brought you to that point because he's waiting for you to become lifeless. He's waiting for you to become a, a limp, uh, so to speak, because once we're in that condition, then God says, okay, now it's time for me to take over. I always wanted to help you with this. The problem with you, though, is you don't think you need the help. So we're going to expend a little energy first. And we're going to bring you to the point where you realize that you need help. And I think this is what's happening with Jacob. Arnold Fruchtenbaum 
of this verse says in verse 24b is the account of the wrestling. And there wrestled a man with him. The Hebrew word for wrestle is a wordplay based on the name of the river, the Jabbok, which would forever serve as a reminder. The Hebrew word for wrestling is found only here and in verse 25 and nowhere else in the entire Hebrew Bible. The word itself comes from the root avak, which means dust. The basic meaning of this word for wrestling is to get dusty in wrestling, to get dusty while wrestling. Although there are three similar, uh, altogether rather, there are three similar sounding words in Hebrew. Jacob, the jabbok, where this is occurring nearby, and then the word for wrestling itself. Who, who is he wrestling with exactly? Well, look at verse 30. And we won't be getting to verse 30 today, but we kind of need the hint as to who this man is that he's wrestling with. It says in verse 30, So Jacob named the place Peniel, for he said, I have seen the face of God. I have seen God face to face. Jacob believed that he was wrestling with God himself. So who is this man? It just says he has the appearance of a man. He, he looked like a man. Jacob, through this, believed it was God that he was wrestling with. I believe that this man, described in verse 24, a man wrestled with him until daybreak, is Jesus Christ. The eternally existent second member of the Godhead. This is a, an example of Christ before the manger. This uh, is an example of Jesus Christ before the virgin birth. Some have called these manifestations of Jesus the angel of the Lord. Some call them theocracies. Uh, theophanies, excuse me, theophanies, and Christophanies, pre-incarnate appearances of Jesus before the manger. There are many examples of this in the Old Testament. I would, if you're interested in this, I'd recommend to you the book by Ron Rhodes, R H O D E S is the author. He has a wonderful book called Christ Before the Manger. And it gives every example where Jesus seems to show up before he actually became incarnated through the virgin conception and the virgin birth. So I think that's who, Jesus, who Jacob is wrestling with. That's why he says, I've seen God. I've seen God face to face. Some have taken this to mean this wrestling is a prolonged time of prayer. And that's a possible interpretation. Charles Ryrie says of verse 24, the man who wrestled Jacob is called an angel in Hosea 12 verse 4 and was evidently the pre-incarnate Christ. Jacob's wrestling involved agonizing prayer. Hosea chapter 12 verse 4 referring to this event says, yes, he wrestled with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought his favor. He found him at Bethel, and there he spoke with us. This idea of prevailing. Some have taken this to mean, as Charles Ryrie writes here, uh, this time of agonizing prayer that he was involved with. Why was he involved in agonizing prayer? Because Esau is coming with 400 men and Jacob does not know how that situation is going to be resolved. There is a, a level of prayer where people can actually agonize before God. I find a reference to this in the book of Colossians. Chapter 4 and verse 12. 
It says, Epaphras, who is one of your number, a bondservant of Jesus, sends you his greetings, always laboring earnestly for you in prayers. And it's interesting that when you study that in the Greek, laboring earnestly for you in prayer, it's the word agonizomai, where we get the word agonize. I mean, this man, Epaphras, <laughs> the type of prayers that he offered on behalf of God's people were the type of prayers that he literally came before the Lord and he was agonizing in prayer, uh, prolonged prayer. A lot more than, you know, God, you know, bless the bunch as we munch the lunch kind of prayer. I mean, prayers for you deposit yourself in the presence of the Lord and you're just ag- you're agonizing. That's the kind of circumstance that Jacob is involved in here. But as you're going to see, there's a lot more to it than agonizing in prayer because he got a dislocated hip out of the whole situation. I mean, we, we can agonize in prayer, but I've never had my hip dislocated as a result. So yeah, part of it is agonizing in prayer, but this was like, a, the best I can tell, this was like a wrestling match that Jacob didn't instigate. God instigated to bring Jacob to the end of himself and to create the situation where the nation of Israel finally receives her name, the nation of Israel. We, 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 we have no knowledge that this special nation that God is raising up is going to have this name. God is creating the situation where the name is going to be given. Just like in Haran, he created the situation where the 12 tribes of Israel would come forth. So you have this situation happening. He sends his family away. He's wrestling with the angel of the Lord. And that leads to a dislocated thigh. And you see that in verse 25. Notice verse 25, when he, when he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he, that's the angel of the Lord, touched the socket of his thigh. So the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. First of all, you have um, a situation here. We know that Human beings are no match for angels. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 11 says of angels, they are greater in might and power than we are. There's, there's not much of a match. We know from Matthew chapter 28 and verse 2 that one angel of the Lord rolled away the stone on Resurrection Sunday. And if you know anything about those stones that they put over the grave, they were massive by design because the Romans didn't want any monkey business. They didn't want someone to come in and steal the body and fake the resurrection. So they put this massive stone over the tomb of Christ. And Matthew 28 verse 2 tells us that one angel of the Lord just rolled it away as if it was nothing. Matthew 28, verse 2 says, And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. We know that one angel of the Lord, Isaiah chapter 37, verse 36, one night killed 185,000 Assyrians. Isaiah 37, 36 says, The angel of the Lord went out and struck 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when men arose early in the morning, behold, all of these were dead. I mean, we are no match in a wrestling match with an angel. This is one of the reasons why I think this is actually God. Because God is allowing Jacob to hang on. It's what we would call the condescension of God. How God comes down to our level. 
to teach us truths that we couldn't learn any other way. The condescension of God is all over the Bible. I mean, we've even seen it in the famous covenant that God entered into with Abram, who later became Abraham in Genesis 15, where according to Genesis 15, verses 9 through 11, and verses 17 through 21, there were animal pieces that were arranged in two parallel rows. The parties of the covenant would pass through the animal pieces. And as the parties to the covenant would pass through the animal pieces, the parties were saying, if we don't fulfill our obligations under the covenant, then let me be torn asunder as have these animals and their pieces, which are now arranged in two parallel rows. That's how they entered into covenants back in Abraham's day. God condescended to the level of man and to the level of the culture and entered into one of those arrangements. It's just this time it was a little different because God put Abram to sleep and God alone, as represented by the oven and the torch, passed through the animal pieces, meaning that if the covenant terms are not fulfilled, God is saying, let me be torn asunder as have these animals. Why would God do something like that? It's called the condescension of God. He understands how man does things and he oftentimes comes down to our level and submits to our culture because that's how God is. The ultimate condescension of God is the incarnation. God became man in the person of Jesus Christ. At the point of the virgin conception, what was added to eternally existent deity in terms of the second member of the Trinity, God the Son, was humanity. God became man. And don't get the idea that the incarnation was some kind of subtraction. It was not. It was not God taking off the God coat and putting on the man coat. The incarnation is not a subtraction, but it's an addition. God, eternally existent, became the God man. He was not the God man prior to the virgin conception, but now he became the God man to do what? To relate to us, to die for us as a man. I mean, how can we really understand what God is like? He is all powerful and we're just human beings. God says, I'll fix that. I'll become the God man. That's the ultimate condescension of God coming down to our level. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 14 says the word, that's Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And what's happening here with Jacob is God is condescending. Because if you're wrestling with an ordinary angel, there's no contest. If you're wrestling with God, who is even more powerful than the angels, it's no contest. But God is allowing Jacob to hang on here. Because he's trying to teach Jacob a lesson. And so you have the situation here followed by an action. And notice what this pre-incarnate Jesus Christ does. He touched the socket of his thigh. Now you read that in English and it just looks like, you know, he, it's like putting your hand on someone's shoulder. That's, that's not what the Hebrew reveals. This was a blow. Uh, a strong blow to that part of the body. And this is what God did. It was a supernatural blow. The book of Isaiah, chapter 6 and verse 7, uses the same word to describing God touching Isaiah's mouth, you remember. Remember, Isaiah was called into the ministry, and it says in Isaiah, chapter 6, verse 7, he, 
as he's seeing this vision of God, he touched, that's the same Hebrew word that's used here, touched my mouth with it and said, behold, he has touched your lips and your iniquity is taken away and your sin is forgiven. This is a, I I would call it not just a touch, a tap on the shoulder, I would call it some kind of blow and it was supernatural. He, he dislocated his thigh, is what God did with Jacob. You see uh, the result there, also in verse 25. It says, he touched the socket of his thigh, so the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated. God did that. And, and what was the occasion of all of this? Verse 25, while he wrestled with him. It took place during this long, um, sort of indecisive struggle that God condescended to, God submitted, submitted to, that went on all night long. And the end result of it is a dislocated thigh. And through all of this, Jacob is going to be blessed. Now, you might be saying, well, hold the phone here. Uh, I thought he was going to be blessed, and you're talking about a dislocated thigh. How do the two coincide? The dislocation is the blessing. Because the dislocation, and it looks to me like it's a, a permanent injury. We're not told, did it last his whole life? But he was limping as we'll see later in the passage, because of it. In fact, there's actually a Hebrew tradition, verse 32, that comes out of it, that the children of Israel, Moses writes, practice to this day. I mean, this to me looks like it was permanent, a permanent problem in his body that God himself caused to bless Jacob. I'm reminded of uh, Paul the Apostle in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 9, where Paul the Apostle says, because of these surpassing, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, what revelations? Paul, 14 years earlier, was caught up to the third heaven. My understanding is the first heaven is the distance from the ground to the clouds. The second heaven would be the distance from the clouds to the stars. The third heaven is beyond the stars. It's where God lives. I wish we were given more details. Paul was caught up into that realm. He heard things that a human being is not fit or equipped to hear. And you could imagine having that kind of experience, the total arrogance that would have overtaken Paul, where he knew things that no one else could know because of this experience that he had 14 years earlier. But the problem with God is God doesn't use arrogant people. He uses the humble. The Bible is very clear on this. He, he opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. So what, what do you do with a man as intellectually gifted as he was at the starting point who has this supernatural revelation that people that are normal like us aren't accustomed to hear? What do you do with a guy like that? How do you keep a guy like that humble? How do you keep a guy like that usable? Well, you bless him. And we think in America, oh, so he got a Rolls Royce and he got a nice place to live and he had a lot of money in his bank account. No, that's not what the Bible says. He blessed him with a thorn in the flesh. People are speculate, well, what was the thorn in the flesh? I don't know, but I know this much, thorns hurt. 
Paul <clears throat> talks about this. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9. Because of these surpassing revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself. It's hard to exalt yourself when you're in pain. But if you're not in pain and you're exalting yourself, God can't use you. So God blesses you by giving you a thorn that reminds you of your humanity so you can't be exalting yourself so you can continue to be used by God. See how this works? You know, in, in all the prosperity type of teaching that you hear today in so-called Christianity, Christian media, that God wants us all rich and he wants us all famous and he wants us all healthy, um, I don't really find them interacting with these texts. The Jacob text, the Paul's thorn in the flesh text. We don't really, in the United States, have a theology of suffering. I mean, we look at suffering as the enemy. And don't get me wrong, there's, there's coming a time in human history where suffering will be a thing of the past, but for now it's a reality, and in some cases it's a necessity. Because it's the very thing that keeps you and myself humble, dependent upon God, and therefore usable. I will be completely honest with you. I would not go to the Lord in prayer if everything in my life had a happy face for the day stamped next to it. I mean, what's the incentive to even pray? But God starts to introduce things in your life that don't make any sense or problems or whatever. And suddenly your prayer life is different. Well, that's God's blessing to you. Because God wants to keep the, chain, the channel of communication open with you. So he can keep using you. But if you don't have any problems, the natural human tendency is to sort of promote yourself, exalt yourself. What do I need God for? God can't use you in that circumstance. Because of these surpassing uh, greatness of revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given to me. Notice the expression here that Paul uses. He doesn't say, ah, oh, this thing is terrible and it's an unwanted intruder. He says, it was given to me. It's a gift. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. That was the point of it. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. Three times I urged the Lord to take it away. Verse 9, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. No thorn in the flesh, no weakness. No weakness, you're not usable. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. I mean, is there something going on with you in your life that never seems to get resolved no matter how many times you pray, for, pray about it? What is God saying to you in that circumstance? He's saying to you, I put that in your life as a blessing. I put that in your life as a gift. Because without it, you wouldn't be weak. And if you're not weak, how can my power be manifested in you? My power is perfected in weakness. Very, very different way <laughs> than what we're accustomed to, to looking at problems. God, in this wrestling match, took Jacob's thigh and dislocated it. And that was a blessing because that brought him to the end of himself. Now the man is qualified to go out now as he's returning to Canaan 
to be what God called him to be. It just took uh, a number of years to get him to this point. Now you've got a guy who, as he's drowning, figures out, I'm drowning. And God said, that's the, that's the battle. I've got to get you to a point where you recognize you're actually drowning. Because as long as you're trying to sort of manipulate your way out of your circumstances through human energy, you're not drowning. You're flailing away. You're trying to help yourself. And I can't be a good lifeguard and come rescue you at that point. I'm looking for you to die uh, in the sense that you go limp in the, in the place where you just sort of trust me. You know, you look at, um, and nobody likes to talk about this, particularly in the United States, but you look at somebody like Johnny Erickson Tata, if you know her story, you know, as a teenager, dove into Chesapeake Bay off a pier. There was a rock there submerged, and because of the accident, she has spent her entire life paralyzed from the neck down. And you look at that and you say, that's just horrific. And it is horrific. I'm not here to marginalize that kind of situation. Paul's circumstance was horrific. He asked God to remove it three times. But listen to Johnny Erickson talk about that and how God used that to give her what most would consider a very influential worldwide ministry. Something that wouldn't exist had it not been for that horrific accident so many years ago. And, and you listen to her talk and how she's been misled by so many Christians who said, well, it's God's will for you to be healed. I would say it is God's will for he to be, her to be healed one day but maybe not today. Here, let, let's pray for you. And then they would dump on her, you know, well, you must not have enough faith. You're still in a wheelchair. Do you realize how destructive that theology is? It's hard enough to go through life in a wheelchair, let alone a bunch of untaught, theologically unsound Christians who don't understand the doctrine of suffering, making her feel like, well, the reason you're in that circumstance is you don't have enough faith. That's double jeopardy. The wheelchair is bad enough. Telling somebody you're there because you, you don't have enough faith, that's worse. You've got to be real careful how you counsel people, folks. Don't be like Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar in the book of Job. And then later, if, if that wasn't enough, Elihu comes in. All telling Job he's in his circumstances because he put himself in those circumstances. And Job says, I've done nothing wrong <laughs> through the whole book. I love that line in the book of Job where Job says, what miserable counselors you all are. <laughs> that's, that's how I feel when you have a lot of well-intentioned, well-meaning Christians that don't understand the doctrine of suffering. Uh, and how they interject themselves into these situations that they have almost no understanding of. You know, a lot of times in counseling, you know what you, you should sit there and do as you're talking to people? Just listen to them. You know, don't, don't come in with some kind of canned theology. Just, just listen to them. When, it, when it's time for you to speak, the Lord will make that clear. And I think a lot of misery in Christianity would be re re resolved if we did a little less talking and a little bit more listening. But this is what happened to, to Jacob. A dislocated thigh, as it says, not from his own fault, not from the devil's fault, not, no demon did this to him, but this theophany or this Christophany did this to him to set him up for blessing. In fact, here Jacob is struggling for blessing. Notice what the angel of the Lord says. The angel of the Lord, verse 26, makes a demand. 
Then he said to Jacob, this angel of the Lord, let me go. Isn't that interesting? Even with a, a dislocated thigh, Jacob is hanging on. Um, that's, if that's not the condescension of God, I don't know what is. God is, is, is like God is allowing him to have the upper hand in this wrestling match with this bodily problem. Why does the angel want to be let go? Because it's almost daybreak. Verse 26, then he, that's the angel of the Lord to Jacob, said, let me go for the dawn is breaking. Now, I don't, I've tried this last week to understand what that means. And I'm here to tell you that I really don't. I've tried though. It might have something to do with Exodus 33 verse 20. Where God says you cannot see my face for no man can see me and live. Maybe that's why the angel of the Lord says it's starting to get light out. Let me go because the day is breaking. We know that it's night, verse 22. Now he arose the same night. This is something that went on all night long. And here's Jacob hanging in there despite a dislocated hip or thigh, I should say. And so now you have Jacob's response. Verse 26, and he said, let me go for the day is breaking. But he, that's Jacob, speaking to the angel of the Lord says, I will not let you go until you bless me. There's a guy that wants the blessing of God. Where he's hanging in there with a dislocated thigh all night long. I mean, whatever God has, he wants. I have to be honest with you. You read that and I say to myself, do I want to be blessed by God this badly? I'm not sure I really do. The nice thing, of course, about being a New Testament Christian is God has already blessed you. Ephesians 1 verse 3 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places because God is dealing with us on the basis of grace. That's why Jesus speaking to the struggling church at Smyrna said, Revelation 2 verse 9, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you're rich. Jacob wants to be blessed. He wants to be blessed badly. And here we are in the year 2023, is it? And we're radically blessed already without even having to ask. It's part of a package deal that God gave you at the point of faith alone in Christ alone. And part of this blessing is this injury which brought him to a greater place of depend dependence on God, making him usable. But part of this blessing is the change of names. This is where the name Israel comes from. You have Jacob's old name, verse 27, and Jacob's new name, verse 28, verse 27. So he said, what is your name? As if God doesn't know. Why does God say, what is your name, when God already knew what his name was? Well, it's the condescension of God. Coming down to our level, coming down to our understanding, to get points across. Verse 27, so he said, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And then the angel of the Lord says, now you're going to have a new name. Verse 28, he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. That's the first reference to Israel in the whole book of Genesis. This special nation that God is raising up. He said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have striv striven with God, you know, strived 
strove, whatever word we're going to use, strove with God and with man and have prevailed. Jacob's new name is Israel. That's why from this point on, as you go through the rest of the scripture, and no other scripture will tell you why this happened, you have to start in Genesis. The name Jacob and the name Israel are synonyms. Different word, same name. Jeremiah 30 verse 7 of the tribulation period says, Alas, for that day is great, there is none like it. It is the time of Jacob's distress, but he will be saved from it. And we say, well, is it a time of Jacob's distress or is it a time of Israel's distress? And the answer is yes. Because Jacob now is going to be used as a synonym, different words, same name, for the name Israel. Israel is going to be used as a synonym for Jacob. Wouldn't we expect this in the book of beginnings? Book of beginnings, the book of Genesis, the the beginning of everything. Universe, life, man, marriage, evil, clothing, religion, salvation, language, government, nations. All of which we would have no idea of had we not given ourselves to the book of Genesis. And one of the big themes of Genesis is the beginning of Israel. And here's how Israel got the name Israel. I mean, we've learned where the 12 tribes came from. Jacob in Haran with two wives and two bridesmaids, maids, I get maidens, I guess we could say. We've got that explanation. Now we've got the explanation of where the name Israel comes from. What does that name Israel even mean here? What does it even mean? Well, it comes from Jacob struggling with God because God condescended to his level and Jacob prevailed. He hung in there in spite of a dislocated thigh that God caused. Arnold Fruchtenbaum writes, he answered Jacob in verse 28 is the name. Your name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. In Hebrew, it is Yisrael, a combination of two words, Sarah and El, and it literally means he who strives with God. Corollary interpretations include God strives, God fights, God contends. A third alternative is may God contend. However, the basic meaning is this. God has fought for Jacob. Now God will fight for Israel. The reason for the name change was, for you have striven. The Hebrew is used only here and in Hosea 12, verse 3, which speaks of the same event and literally means you have striven. And this is the first part of the name Israel. Fruchtenbaum goes on and it says, furthermore, Jacob has striven with two categories. With God to gain the blessing, and with men such as Esau and Laban, and has prevailed. Just like you prevailed, Jacob, in this, re- in this wrestling match, it, it parallels with your life that you have prevailed with Laban, and, and you are about to prevail with your estranged brother Esau. Furthermore, Jacob has striven with two categories, with God to gain the blessing and with men such as Esau and Laban and has prevailed. Even after his loss of strength by the dislocated hip, he has still prevailed in that he received the blessing of God. That is what he had striven for. That is what he received. You you prevailed with Laban, You're going to prevail with Esau and with a dislocated thigh. You've been wrestling with me all night long and you've hung in there because I condescended to your level and you've won. You've prevailed. 
And that's where this name Israel comes from. It's like Jacob has fought and won, and now God is going to fight for Jacob. Which means God is going to fight for Israel because Jacob is a synonym for Israel. That's why when you get to the very end of the Bible related to the battle of Armageddon, it says in Zechariah 14, 2 and 3, For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be captured, the houses plundered, the women ravished, half of the city exiled, but the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. When Israel has no ability in the end times to fight for herself, God says, I'm going to fight for you. Why would God say that? Because Israel, that's your name. That's what it means. And Zechariah doesn't say, okay, here's a footnote. Everybody go back and read Genesis 32. Because the Holy Spirit is expecting us to already understand Genesis 32 before we get to the book of Zechariah. That's how fundamental and foundational the book of Genesis is. If you don't give yourself to the book of Genesis, your mind is just filled with question marks as to why things are happening in the rest of the Bible. You prevailed, you strove, God says, I'm going to prevail, and I'm going to strive for you nationally. And when every God-hating nation in the world wants your blood, and it looks like they're going to win, God says, I'm going to show up. And fight for you. Because that's your identity. Real fast here, this is my last point before we close. But I want you to understand that this change of names is a big deal. In uh, Genesis 17, the circumcision chapter, you'll find two change of names happening. One for Abraham, one for Sarai. Genesis 17, verse 5 says, No longer shall your name be called Abram. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your new name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. Then to Sarai, he says the same thing. Genesis 17, verse 15. Then God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. What God does is he changes the names of people to fit their destiny. Jacob has a new destiny because he's now in a place where, God, I either <laughs> depend on you or ain't going to happen. You're a new destiny. You have a new destiny, so you need a new name. What did God say to Peter, whose name was originally what? Simon. God changed his name. Jesus changed his name. In Matthew 16, verse 18, it says, I also say to you that you are Peter, which in Greek is Petros, meaning little stone. I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock, now, I don't have time to get into it, but the rock here is not Peter. Because there's a change in the Greek word to a large rock. Peter, you're the little rock, but I'll build my church on the big rock. The big rock is Peter's confession of who Jesus was, which is accurate. I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I'm going to give you the name Rock Stone. And let me tell you folks, that guy was anything but a rock. I call him the apostle with the foot-shaped mouth. 
I mean, he's, he's, he messes up everything. And God says, new name, new destiny. Rock, stability. Now, you go into the book of Acts, oh my goodness. There isn't a greater servant of God in the first ten chapters than this man Peter. Peter's the guy standing up on the day of Pentecost, preaching the gospel, and 3,000 are saved. The same guy that sunk when he walked out on the water. The same guy that Jesus said to him, get behind me, Satan. You see what happened here? New name, new identity, new destiny. How about the church at Philadelphia? Revelation chapter 3, verse 12. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down from heaven from my God and my new name. Struggling Philadelphia got three names, brand new. Name of my God, name of the city, which you'll be part of, and my name. Maybe you're here today, you don't know Christ personally, and you need your name changed. I don't know what your name is going to be, but I know God wants to give you a new one. And the reason I can say that dogmatically is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature, or new creation, new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, the new things have come. How can someone be a new creation in Christ Jesus without a new name? Because your destiny is brand new. It's totally different. So if you want your name changed, and we have a name tag table at the back, but this has nothing to do with that. This is something God does. He will give you right now as I'm speaking, if you're unsaved, he'll give you a new name. Because he wants to make you a new creature in Christ Jesus. The old has come. The old is gone, rather. The new has come. Jesus stepped out of eternity into time 2,000 years ago to deal with a problem we couldn't deal with, which is sin. He absorbed in his body the wrath of a holy God in our place. He asks us to not trust ourselves for our salvation, but to trust what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. And right now, anybody within the sound of my voice can change their whole destiny and receive this new name from God by placing their faith in Jesus alone. And as you do that, you become a new creation in Christ Jesus. It's not something you join a church to receive, fill out a card to receive, Walk an aisle to receive, give money to receive. It's a matter of privacy between you and the Lord where the Lord will convict you of your need to do this and you respond through volition by trusting in Jesus alone. I mean, you figure out you're drowning. And then once you understand that you're drowning, you figure out you can't save yourself. Only God can. And you trust in Christ for your eternity. Right then and there. You're a new creature and receive that new name. Anybody within the sound of my voice can trust in Christ. People within the building, people watching or listening live online, people watching or listening to archives after the fact, right now can change their eternity with a new destiny, which is just as real as the new destiny that Jacob received as he was here as he was blessed by God. I hope if you need more clarity on this, you'll talk to me afterwards as I'm available. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for these verses and how they add to our understanding of how you work. I pray, Lord, that this week you draw us close to yourself as we seek to live for you. 
in a fallen world. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And God's people said.